this week on waterways, sea turtle nesting, and species spotlight, three spot damselfish. Sea turtles. These majestic reptiles may currently be found swimming the waters of the Florida Keys. Hawksbill, loggerhead, and green turtles are three species that were once abundant, but today are threatened or endangered. National wildlife refuge areas and laws protecting turtles are helping to stabilize the dwindling numbers. Repopulating is slow. Sea turtles are one of the most docile sea creatures. They cannot retract their heads into their shells like a land turtle and have few, if any, defense mechanisms. To compensate for this lack of protection, Sea turtles may average just over 100 eggs in a nest, called a clutch. However, it is estimated that only 1% of these reach maturity. Maturity is reached at 30 years, at which time the sea turtle is able to reproduce. Tom Wilmers, a wildlife biologist, has been monitoring the nesting of sea turtles in Key West National Wildlife Refuge since 1985. You know, it's a real important concept to understand that the turtles down here in the Keys have marginal nesting habitat. If you look down the beach this way, you can see the rack line coming down along here and there's an even higher one right here. And if you look over here, you can see where the turtle nested. And when we dig down to this nest, we're probably going to hit water. During nesting season, Tom and his long list of volunteers first mark the nests. These nests can be found by the large turtle tracks and depressions from their crawl. Since these turtles are really, uh, they're really dependent on the place where they nested the first time. Uh, they come back to the same place every year. It isn't like they can go just anywhere else. There aren't many beaches in the Keys that are suitable, suitable to begin with, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of unnerving to see, uh, to see all these nests, you know, getting into these narrower and narrower places. I have islands out in Great White Heron Refuge that uh, all the eggs are flooding out this year. Uh, none of them made it. And um, it's just because the water is getting a little higher down here. Um, it doesn't take much, but uh, you know, just a little bit. Now again, some of this could be beach erosion, of course, but the water's going up out here, and, and there's no question in my mind um, that uh, just that little bit that I've seen here in my 16 years is making an enormous difference on these very narrow beaches here. So I'm just gonna dig this one out, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see what's down inside. Sea turtles are one of the world's greatest mariners. They can travel thousands of miles and then return to the same beach to nest. If the beach is unsuitable, the eggs will be laid, but will never hatch. Successful nesting requires a sloping beach platform with open ocean exposure and minimal disturbance. The closer the nest is to the water, the easier it is for the hatchlings to traverse the beach. Nests are often trampled by humans and unearthed by curious dogs. The incubation period for most turtles in Florida is 40 to 50 days. When the nest suddenly becomes concave, it means the eggs have hatched and Tom knows it's time to start counting. What we do out here is uh, we count every single egg, uh, we get total productivity and we have the luxury of doing that because we don't have a lot of turtles out here. So we want to get as accurate a count as we can on how they're doing. 
because it's, it's not just how many nests, uh, it's how many you get coming back here over time. When a sea turtle successfully hatches, its struggle has only begun. The vegetation that was once a small hurdle for the mother now becomes an enormous obstacle for the hatchling. Some turtles do not even make it to the surface of the sand. Sea oat roots can grow over the nest, trapping the hatchlings. Come here, look at this. This is out of sight. Look right there. It's, oh, what a shame. Look at this. See, there's one right there. Uh, come here, look at this. Oh, come over this side. Can you see it? Look at that. It got that close to the top. It did exactly what we just talked about. There it is. You can see it coming out of the roots. It got up there and it couldn't move. It got stuck. You gain the ability to stay above the water line, but you risk getting your babies stuck in the vegetation, and, and especially in thick areas like the sea oats here. So we've got a, a really heart tugging uh, scene here. Pull, pull him out, feel how tight he's, wa watch this. He's in there so tight, that little turtle, that. There we go. Sometimes Tom arrives so soon after the nest is hatched that he finds live hatchlings still caught in the roots. These hatchlings would surely die if not for a little help. And we've got some live babies that we're rescuing. And um, what I do is I use fresh water to uh, just kind of rinse them off real good and hydrate them a little bit. Uh, and we use a moist towel and a cooler to uh, to keep them in, and yeah, we'll arrange that towel here in a minute. But you can see they get a little bit antsy the minute you uh, you give them a little bit of fresh water. They uh, they want to get out to sea right now, but you can see that the flippers are bent on this guy. They're going to go to uh, the sea turtle hospital up in Marathon. The first 24 hours are crucial to a baby sea turtle. The hatchling will swim frantically for that first day in an attempt to reach a weed line or sargasm patch. Sometimes this food source is 20 miles offshore. If the hatchling is dehydrated, injured, or exhausted, the journey will never be successful. We're working with our hatchling sea turtles today. Our hatchling sea turtles actually came in about three weeks ago uh, from uh, Tom Wilmers, who goes out and collects out of the nests for us uh, any of the sea turtles that may be injured or not able to come out of the nests on their own. Uh, they do come in with little abrasions on them and uh, sores from being caught in the nest or wrapped in the nest uh, with uh, any weeds or anything along those lines. So um, they do come to us to be looked after and checked over. We make sure that they're able to eat on their own and um, give them any medication or anything like that that they need. So this is preparing the food for the little hatchlings. Uh, they need tiny, tiny little pieces and um, Sometimes we need to cut up to 20, 25 uh, tentacles of squids into tiny little pieces for our hatchlings to eat. Now some of our hatchlings do not eat on their own and we actually have to open their mouth up and place the squid in their mouth and let them uh, figure out what it actually tastes like. And then after a little while they actually catch on that they should be eating it on their own and they do quite well. We usually start them out in a really shallow uh, water situation so that they can uh, get to 
the squid quite easily. And um, these guys have actually been here for about three weeks, so they've actually learned to swim and dive and get their food quite well. Uh, whereas sometimes we really have to work with them and um, change the water levels and do different things with them to actually encourage them to eat well. We normally give them about 10-15 minutes and we see how much they've eaten. If they're still hungry after that, we'll add some more squid or if they've run out of squid, we'll uh, keep them going until they're basically full and not interested anymore in eating. These guys uh, will be ready to go out into the wild uh, within the next couple weeks. Uh, what we like to do is we want to make sure that our hatchlings get out uh, back into the sargassum weed line. Uh, what we look for is uh, basically what we're seeing here now. They're able to get down to the bottom to get food. Um, they're using their front flippers, as you can see, to kind of tear and rip and get little pieces of food. So what I've done is given them a little bit bigger pieces as we've progressed through the weeks. And um, they're showing us that they can swim well, they can eat well, they have no um, real potential wounds or sores on them and um, they can basically take care of themselves right now. Sometimes the turtles are unable to tear the food or even swim because they are premature or because they become disfigured while struggling to break free from roots. In these cases, Corinne and volunteers at the Turtle Hospital give special care. The other things we do uh, with our hatchlings that actually come in premature like this is we do a little bit of physical therapy with them. So we uh, need to support their head and just get some of those uh, movements going in some of these limbs that are pretty tight. The tendons are very constricted and um, we work with them every day when we feed them. We also do a little bit of physical therapy as well, hoping that we'll be able to loosen them up and they'll be able to swim someday for us. Summertime is when loggerheads and green turtles reproduce. This season, Tom and his crew have rescued almost 20 hatchlings. I have these baby green turtles that Tom Wilmers had brought in from Fish and Wildlife Service off of the Marquesas area that he monitors the nesting every year down there. We have with us nine baby greens right now. He brought me a total of 10. These are all going to be released today. We're going to go offshore and find a sargasm weed line to let them go in. That's where they usually spend the first year of their life floating around and it's their habitat, food and shelter. This is a little loggerhead and this one's a little green turtle. And you can see the difference in their shell patterns and their colors. The loggerheads are a little bit like brownish color and the greens are almost black. Their shells will turn more like a mottled color when they're full grown. These guys will get more orangish colored. And then uh, their flippers, you can see how long the green flippers are versus the loggerheads, a little bit different. And then their underbellies are also a big difference. The green's got a big white belly, loggerheads a little bit more skeleton looking. The loggerheads are also meat eaters and the greens are mainly uh, vegetarians. So they have difference in their diets. Also, I don't know if you did see their little egg tooth right on the tip of their nose. They still have them right there. And also, this is the only green turtle nest we've had in the Keys so far this year. And I'll probably be the only one. The nesting season's almost done. Only one green turtle nest found this season. The few that were rescued, each only the size of a human thumb, help carry the hope for the future of this magnificent animal. It's very exciting to us uh, knowing that we're able to uh, help a threatened species. The loggerhead is uh, threatened along the Florida coast, so having um, these little guys come into us is incredible, and um, watching them grow before your eyes is pretty special. In a couple weeks, we'll actually be able to uh, take them out uh, to the sargassum weed line, and. Uh, to actually set them into the weed line is an incredible experience. You just really feel that you're giving back uh, to nature or back to the world, something that probably would have been lost if we had not intervened. Unfortunately, many of our nests are destroyed either naturally or 
uh, by man building uh, new communities or uh, building campfires over top of nests, uh, stepping on them, digging them up. Uh, many countries still eat uh, sea turtle uh, eggs and um, that is really uh, threatening the species even more. So when we do see these hatchlings come in, it is um, a great feeling. When the hatchlings are given a clean bill of health, they are brought out to the sargasm weeds many miles out at sea. Richie Moretti, director of the Turtle Hospital, and Tina Brown from the Turtle Museum in Key West both make regular trips halfway to Cuba. The first step when a weed line is found is to make sure there are no predators lurking below the surface. Dolphin fish and sharks are the baby turtles' main predators. We're gonna rig up these ballyhoo and fish this little weed patty. Make sure there's no hungry dolphin or larger fish out there before we put our baby turtles out there so they have a little better chance. And who knows, we might get dinner in the meantime. When they're sure the weed line is free of predators, the babies are set free. Although a turtle cannot retract its head into its shell, the hatchlings will tuck into a ball, making it harder for the predator to bite off a limb. However, most of the predators could swallow these tiny hatchlings whole. There is no way to know if the hatchlings survive. The turtle's change in size is so great that any microchip or tagging scenario is impossible. Statistically, the more rescued and released, the better chance a portion will reach maturity. Detractors from the cause claim that man should not interfere with nature. So I'd say in probably 75 and 80 percent of the turtles that come in, and probably more, are all affected by people. So I think we owe them, the ones that live through their impacts with people, I think we owe it to them to fix them. And that's why we do that, because we impact them, we should mitigate the damages we do to turtles, and that's what we do here at the Turtle Hospital. We fix the turtles. Likewise, most of the failed sea turtle nest gestations are due to human infringement. However, Tom Wilmer's hatchling rescue is a byproduct of his monitoring program. The information about what's out there is what matters the most. Until you know what you have, you don't know how to protect them. How are the law enforcement uh, officers here uh, gonna protect these turtles unless we know that we have a resource here to protect? I mean, I'm not law enforcement, I can't protect it, so my, my work is blended into what other people do as well. It's, it's gotta be a unified uh, effort. It's not about uh, rescuing babies. It's about getting a baseline knowing what we did, we did have versus what we might have 10 years from now. It's good for, for uh, 50 years from now. It's hoped that 30 to 50 years from now, 
Tom's successors may see some of the turtles he rescued returning to their place of birth to reproduce more of these awesome creatures. Common name, three-spot damselfish. Family, Pomacentridae. Genus, Stegastus. Species, Planophons. Diet, Omnivore. Size, three to five inches. Depth, zero to 130 feet. Color, varies from yellowish brown to gray. Distribution, Caribbean, Bahamas, South Florida, Bermuda, and the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the three-spot damselfish is the most pugnacious fish in the Florida Keys and throughout the Caribbean region. It aggressively defends territories that are generally smaller than about a square yard. Uh, within those territories, it, it raises algal gardens, and we call them gardens because the three-spot selectively plucks out and removes species of algae that it doesn't like to feed on leaves behind a, a filamentous mat of algae that it prefers to eat. And then it keeps all the other herbivorous fishes and even sea urchins outside of that territory as best it can. These farmers will defend against any intruder. The three-spot damselfish cannot be intimidated. In any contest with an individual, they almost always chase them out. They'll even attack divers. I've been bitten on the forehead by three spot and drew blood, so they're, they're very aggressive little fishes. These aggressive fish are abundant in the Florida Keys. Unlike some reef species that are being overfished, populations of small reef fish like the damselfish are thriving. One possibility why there are so many damselfish in the Florida Keys is that we've fished out a lot of the predators that would normally be feeding on uh, smaller fishes like the damselfish, and so their numbers may have increased as a result of our overfishing of the grouper snapper complex. So uh, we have some studies in place to see what's happening to the reef fish community as a consequence of uh, the fully protected zones. And in fact, there is a program particularly being run by the Nature Conservancy that's looking specifically at changes in three-spot damselfish inside and outside of the fully protected zones. These fully protected zones, or no-take zones, were implemented in 1997, so the effects are still being evaluated. However, it is evident that an increase of three-spot damselfish populations could be disastrous for the living coral. In the process of, of building these algal gardens, uh, three-spot damsels can be damaging to live coral. They'll pluck at the live tissues, leaving behind bits of dead skeleton, and then algal tufts start to grow from those bits of dead skeleton. And as the damselfish bites away more bits and the algae grows, it can start to smother and, and kill off living coral. This is yet another case of human interference in the balance of nature. It is hoped that no-take zones will help reverse this damage. <laughs>